we don't want that. So, what a joy it is to be here. I love to do this. This is one of the things that just tickles me pink. So, is to bring the gospel to people. And um, so, let's begin with prayer. I always like to begin with prayer. Father, I just thought thank you for today and for everyone gathered. I thank you for your love, which knows no bounds, Lord. We pray again that you would fill, that Father, you would fill me and that you would fill everyone here and those watching on line right now, the live stream, and those who will be watching later, Lord, that you would fill us with a great and extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit, Lord. James tells us we have not because we ask not, and in Matthew, or no, it's in Luke, um, Jesus says that if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we ask big today, Lord. And so we pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit throughout this day and throughout this week as we celebrate Thanksgiving together. Um, and Father, I pray that you would give me words with clarity, that you would keep me from saying the things I don't need to and bring me to say everything I do need, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would bring a message of power, grace, and truth, Lord. And we pray for everyone here and for those watching online and for those who will be watching later that you would give us open ears to hear, open eyes to see, and open hearts to receive the word that you have for us this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 40 years ago, I arrived at this church, a very broken young man, broken by my own choices and my own actions, broken by my own hand. It was my fault. I can't blame anybody. And broken by my sin, the depth of my sin. I arrived here just 11 days after sustaining a very serious head injury as a result of my drinking. My friends and I were working our way through school at the University of Washington by working at Vandy Camp's Dutch Bakery. Anybody remember those wonderful Vandy Camp's pastries? Well, I lived on that for five years. But, um, <laughs> but we uh, went out drinking after work, and we went to University Bar and Grill. And the barmaid was having fun with us, so she was making the drinks uh, extra strong. And after the seventh double I blacked out, I was a blackout drinker. And um, what happened after that, my friends told me, but one of my friends had forgotten his coat at work, so he drove back to uh, Vandy Camps to get, get the coat right there on the corner of Valley and Yale, in, right by, on the south end of, of Lake Union. And when I got into the bakery, I went berserk. I started turning over equipment and hitting people, and then I ran out in, of the, the side door of the building and ran towards Mercer Street on-ramp and exit to get on the freeway. And my friend Doug caught me by my hand and I wrenched away from him and then ran down Valley Street toward jail and I tripped and fell and hit my head against the curb. And then I threw up immediately. That's what they told me happened. So um, they, they drove me home. Instead of driving me to the hospital, they took me home and threw me on my bed. And they were so drunk, they spent the night on the floor just sleeping it off. Next morning, I woke up and I had this grapefruit-sized lump on my head. And I took a shower, and then I went to call work, and no words would come out. And they saw that something was extremely wrong, and so they rushed me to the University of Washington Hospital emergency room. As soon as they saw me, they took me in to get a CAT scan, and when the CAT scan results had come back, Dr. Lozier, the head of the neurology department, came in with a team of residents, about seven or eight residents, and asked them, what should we do? And the resident said, well, we need to drill to let the blood off, because I had five bleeds in my brain, and I had a subdural and epidural hematoma in my speech center, in my Broca's area. And Dr. Lozier said, Grant, you've let this bleed for about 18 hours. I don't think you're going to live. But if you do live, you will never speak again. I had done this to myself. I can't blame anybody. I had lost my ability to speak, my ability to smell. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't walk. Lost my job. Lost my schooling. Lost my apartment. Couldn't pay my bills and couldn't pay the hospital bills. I was one step away from being homeless. 
So my mom and dad, living down in here in Olympia, members of, of this church, invited me to come and live with them. And they were so gracious. And the first Sunday was September 26 of 1983. I came to this church over in the fellowship hall. And the, I was so weak, I couldn't sit in one of the, the chairs. So they brought out, the men carried out one of the overstuffed chairs that was in the uh, fireside room at the time. And I sat in that chair. And I got to tell you, I was so welcomed here. And you gave me grace, such grace. So this has always been a place, not just a, a, a church that's not only called grace, but a congregation that shows grace over and over again. And my wife and I, it's life later on as well. Howard Johnson, the, the pastor at the time, I think he was out of his mind, but he asked me to give my testimony just about six weeks after this head injury. Uh, my speech did come back. This, the third day in the hospital, Dr. Lozier came in and said, say the word bird. And I couldn't say anything. I, I was speechless. The seventh day, my dad had gotten all the supporting churches. He was a covenant missionary, and he got all the supporting churches, including this church, to pray for me. So I had thousands of people praying for me. And on the seventh day, Dr. Lozier came in and said, say the word or the phrase Methodist Episcopal. <laughs> and I said, Methodist Episcopal. And he was shocked. Uh, he was just flabbergasted. Years later, I was able to meet him and thank him for uh, saving my life. So Howard asked me to do my testimony at the Thanksgiving service. And looking back on that, that's not the wisest thing to ask somebody just six weeks off of drugs to give their testimony. <laughs> but you know, that became a milestone in my life. So I know that he was spirit-led to, to do that. So different things have become milestones in my life. And then verses and passages, the Lord has taken these certain verses and passages and made them foundation stones in my life. We all have those, right? You have them. You have verses that are near and dear to your heart that become foundation stones in your walk with the Lord. And I'm going to share one of those foundational passages that was in my life, and it's a perfect text for our pre-Thanksgiving uh, service uh, today. But it's Colossians 2, 6, and 7. So i got to get the little clicker out here. Where did I put my water? There we go. Oh, i got to turn it on. That would help. Technology. Okay, here we go. Can you read that all right? I hope so. Okay, therefore, this is Colossians 2, 6, and 7. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. So notice what it begins with, therefore, and as you've heard many, many pastors probably tell you, when there's a therefore, you see what it's therefore. Well, I'm not going to do that this morning, because anytime you jump into Paul, uh, you have to go back to the very beginning. Like Romans is a solid argument from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 14 or 15. And there's a therefore in chapter 12 of, of Paul. And to understand that, therefore, you have to go back and read the first 11 chapters. Well, this would be chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 5, so we're not going to do that. So as a homework assignment, go home and read through Colossians a couple times this week. And look at the context of these two verses. See where they, they fit in into his um, message to the Colossians. So it says, therefore, as you have received... And it's, it's strange, but in Colossians, it doesn't really tell us how they had received Christ Jesus the Lord. So in order to find out how they had received Christ Jesus the Lord, there is a sister book to Colossians. Does anybody know which one that is? It's a twin sister. It's the book of Ephesians. They have very, very common uh, themes, sometimes language that's exactly the same. So if we go over to uh, the sister book, Colossians, or Ephesians, chapter 2, this really well-known verse, here we go. Is that it? I just had a bunch of treatment that ruined my eyes, so I'm getting cataract surgery in three, three weeks, so I'm really looking forward to having new eyes. So, um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I'm reading from the RSV because I've memorized this out of the RSV, and I can't. If I memorize something, I've got to stick with the version I memorized. So. 
It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man or any person or any woman should boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith. How did we see Christ Jesus the Lord? By grace through faith. And just a comment on grace. We, we always think of grace as kind of this intangible thing. You know, it's the unmerited favor of God. So it's just an attitude of God's heart. But really, biblically, grace is so much more than that. And so I've, over the years, I've come up with a definition, a, a fuller definition, based on all these different passages, that grace is the unmerited, undeserved, kind and generous power and action of God to forgive, save, and transform forever broken and sinful lives. It's power. It's gracious power and powerful grace. And I've been living in the power of His grace now for 40 years since you so graciously welcomed me home. For by grace you've been saved through faith. So if we go back to our text, it says, Therefore, as you have received by grace through faith, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. It says, Christ Jesus, Christ is the word for Messiah. So that therefore, as you receive Messiah Jesus the Lord, and the Lord, we, we normally think of that as master and that kind of idea, but from Paul's perspective, and I'm not going to go in this, it would take another 20 minutes, but uh, from Paul's perspective, both as a Hebrew of Hebrews and as a Gentile, he would have understood this as a proclamation of Jesus' deity, that Jesus is God. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as God, so walk in him. Then we come to the main subject verb here. I'm an English major, so I'm going to bore you to death with grammar today. So if you get that glazed look, I'm going to shock you back awake or something. So um, the subject verb pair in a sentence is the main idea of, of even a complex sentence. It's the main idea. So the main idea in this, this whole passage, these verses, are so walk in him. The, the verb is walk and then in him is prep. Prep, uh, prepositional phrase. And this is a command. It's not telling us, well, you better think about doing this, or you, you might think about doing this. This is, do this, walk in him. But when we look at what he's asking us to walk in, I'm, I'm kind of blown away. This was a revolutionary passage for me. It completely changed my understanding of how not only do we receive the God, you know, salvation and, and the Lord, but how we walk in him. And so, so walk in him. Everywhere they went in that day, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, they walked. If you were going to the market, you walked. If you were going to pay your taxes, you walked. If you were going to synagogue, you walked. If you were going to a neighboring town to visit your relatives, you walked. Most people didn't own horses or donkeys. They were extremely expensive. So walking became synonymous with life. For us, it would be, uh, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so drive in him. But it doesn't really work too well. Uh, so, so walk in him. And notice it says, in him. And who are we talking about? Christ Jesus the Lord. So live out your life in Jesus. Let him be the floor beneath your feet. He is the walls of our life, and He is the roof over our heads. We live and move and have our being in Jesus. We are to walk in Him. And then there are, here's where we get more grammar, so don't, don't go crazy on me here and fall asleep. Did it, did it change? Yeah, okay. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And then you notice one, two, three, four. There are four participles here. And when I was in seminary, um, I had this book Greek to me. This was my Greek uh, text. And it said, quote, at one time, vera verb and ad detective, adjective, right? Ad detective, got together under strange circumstances and produced little party zipple. <laughs> Pretty silly, isn't it? But I can remember it to this day. So a participle is a ing verb, usually unless it's past tense, but ing verb that modifies a noun. So the running man, man is a noun, running is an ing verb, so it's used as an adjective, running man. They can actually be also used adverbally, and these are four adverbial 
participles that are modifying so walk in him. It's telling us how we are to walk. And here's the shocking thing. The three are passive participles. What do I mean by that? An active verb and a passive verb. Remember in English class, you always got dinged if you use the passive voice, right? My, I use Grammarly when, Grammarly when I write, and it's always dinging me for the passive voice. You're writing passively, right? Actively. So an illustration is, here's an active verb. I hit the ball. I'm the subject. Hit is the action, and the ball is the object. I hit the ball. A passive verb is, I was hit by the ball. So I'm the subject, but I'm receiving the action. So here, the first three are passives. It means that we are receiving this action from God. These are not things that we are commanded to do, although we're commanded to walk in Him. And how do we walk in Him? By His doing this work in our life as we trust Him, as we have faith in Him. And this is grace. This is, these are all th actions of God. Gracious, the gracious power of God to do these marvelous things in our life. And I've watched him do it in my life over the last 40 years. And sometimes I just, I'm, I'm amazed at how kind he is and how gracious he is. So, the first one, having been firmly rooted, and it implies in him, because if you see the one and two there, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, so it's having been firmly rooted in him and now being built up in him. This verb is used only twice in the New Testament. And it's just what you do when you root a plant. You plant it and you hope those roots grow deep into the pot. What happens if you leave it in too small of a pot? It gets all root bound. But notice this illustration. Who's the dirt? Being firmly rooted in him. So who's the dirt? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> That's, yeah, Jesus is the dirt, and we're the tree who's... He is sinking our roots. We don't sink our own roots into the dirt. He causes our roots to go deep and into what? Into Jesus. And that's the first thing he does when you come to faith in Christ. Because this is something that has already happened to the Colossians, and it's likely already happened to you, that Jesus has sunk your roots deep into him. So, there are only two occurrences of this verb, and the other occurrence is found in one of my favorite passages in Ephesians chapter 3, verses, verses 14 through 19. It's one of Paul's remarkable prayers that we can pray for our children, for ourselves, for our pastors, for whoever. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the rich of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self or in the inner being. So he's praying for one thing, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being, in the inner self. And then he gives us three purposes for which, for which he's praying. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Jesus isn't out here anymore. He's living inside of each one of us. And we need Holy Spirit power so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through our trusting that he's there and trusting in him. Day by day, moment by moment. Strengthened with power through his spirit. And then it goes on and says, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, and there's that word, to be rooted deeply into something. And what is it here to be deeply rooted? Some people will say this is deeply rooted into our love for other people. No, no, no. In, uh, if, in Revelation, John actually takes on the Ephesian church later on in their life and charges them with having lost their first love and to once again do the acts. And so it sounds like it's their acts of love, but John also says over in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. So our first love is Jesus. When I came back to the church here, I fell in love with Jesus because he so loved me. He opened my eyes to understand that. And so with this first thing that Jesus does in our life and through the power of the Holy Spirit is to sink your roots deep into Jesus and deep into his love. And what, how does his love describe? May be able to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. So if this love surpasses knowledge, and yet we are to know its width and breadth and height and length, it's suggesting that it's immeasurable, that it's boundless, that you, we will never exhaust it. We will never sink our, God will never sink our roots deep enough into Jesus. We will be spending eternity growing deeper and deeper in our knowledge of his love for us. Hmm. And then it goes on, and that's the second uh, purpose for this Holy Spirit power. Third one, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Here's number three, that you may be filled up with the fullness of God. So we have Christ dwelling in us, number one. Number three, the fullness of God. Not, not so much individually. Yes, it's individually, but we're talking about the body of Christ here. Hmm. It reminds me of the verse Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I was in my stuff in Seattle doing all that wild living. Jesus loved me. The Father loved me. When you were in your wild stuff, whatever it was, whether it was in your pride or whether it was in your wild living like mine, he loved you too when you were still in your stuff. And he loved the church when we were all still in our, in our garbage, in our moral gar garbage. So one of the, the things that Jesus put in my life was an illustration. It's one of my favorite illustrations. Right now we're sitting at sea level. And as you're sitting in the seat there, there is 14.7 pounds of oxygen bearing in on you. Every square inch, there's 14.7 pounds of oxygen pushing in on you. And so we live in a pressurized atmosphere. If we didn't live in a pressurized atmosphere, if we lived in a zero pressurized, or, you know, with zero pressure, you'd have to suck air in. But we don't. Take a big breath right now. You see, it just flows in because it's pressurized. It's like we're always on a little teeny CPAP machine, right? <laughs> always pushing air in. God's love is like that. His love is always there, pressing in on us from every side. And whether we know it or not, his love is still there. When I forget about it, he's still loving you. He's not like Santa Claus. He doesn't love you only when you're nice and when you're naughty. Boy, are you going to get it. And when we breathe in, when we remember that he loves me, then his love comes rushing in into my mind and into my being. It's always there. You know, it's always been there since before you were ever created. It was there at your birth. It was there when he created you, when he knit you together while you were in your mother's womb. He has loved you every moment of your life. And that love has never changed. What's changed is our understanding of it. We've been darkened in our minds and our understanding, have we not? Right now I know but a thimble full of his love. But boy, is a thimble full, but is the thimble full. So moving on, we come to the second party zipple. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The first one is having been firmly rooted, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, firmly rooting us in Jesus and his love, and now being built up in him. And so this verb, uh, and notice it's again, in him. So we're to walk in him, and now we're being told how to do it. It occurs eight times in seven verses, six in Paul, one in First Peter, and one in Jude. And uh, so this is a very, it, Paul likes this term. He uses it a lot. And so the idea, I used to show up a building with this when I preached on this text, but now I've come to the conclusion that it's actually a temple he's talking about. And so it's being built up into a, a holy temple, temple. Sound like 1 Peter? That's where this word occurs, right? 1 Peter where it talks about a temple made up of living stones. So there's a notable text that has this word in it. In Ephesians, again, we turn over to this sister book. Chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built, there's that verb, uh, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Here we have again that idea of God in the spirit in Colossians 1.26. It says, the mystery hidden from the ages, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, God in you. And so that's true both individually but also corporately. We're being built into this holy building and we are as living stones. And who's doing that? Are we doing it to ourselves? No, it's grace. Our job is to trust him, that he's doing it day by day, week by week, month by month. It's hard to see, isn't it? It's hard to see the change in us that he's doing, but... When you look back at your life and look at the, in the wake of your life, in the wake of His grace, then you can see the change. Just think about where you were 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 40 years ago. And so this week, last Sunday, we had a send-off party at the church I was serving and it took a while to get there because I had so many setbacks in my health. So after the service and after the meal, I was standing talking to somebody, and I had a coronary event. So I ended up in the hospital for, for uh, two, two, day, or two nights and basically two days, three days. And uh, while I was in the hospital that first full day, I had a nurse. She had long red hair, and I was so in turmoil over some very, very difficult decisions that I have to be making between... Do I accept these consequences in my health or do I accept these consequences in my health? So I wasn't really paying attention to her in, in the sense of how she was receiving me or seeing me. Or... So the next day, my friend Frank from church stopped by to visit me. And a couple days later, I get this card from him. I grew up in Japan, so he always sends me cards with Japanese things on it. But he says, as I left you and Nancy at the hospital, the young red-haired nurse caught my eye. She remarked how peaceful it was to be in your presence. Now, was she experiencing me? Because I was in a great deal of turmoil. Who was she experiencing? Jesus in me. And I can't see that. I just know that I struggle a lot. And we can see Jesus in you because you are being built into this holy temple. And I see Jesus in you every time I come here. That you're being built together, living brick by living brick, into this house of God. So that when you go out from here, you take your individual little living, living stone, and you go out, and wherever you go, if you go to work, you're still the church, and you are taking God in the person of, of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, and even that you may be filled with the fullness of God. You're taking God with you. He's inside of you. He's with you always. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And people are watching you, folks. And it's, I'm not telling you to do something. I'm just saying relax and let Jesus live through. Just trust him that he's there. So that's the second one. Now we get to the third one. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith. It's literally, and being established in your faith, just as you were instructed. It's unfortunate that the Nazbe translated your faith because it doesn't say you're there. It says the. So it says, and established, being established in the faith. And so... Being established, um, that word occurs eight times in the New Testament, one in Mark, five in Paul, and two in Hebrews. And so again, it's a, uh, it's a word that Paul loves, but the, the, uh, one of the verses in Hebrews is remarkable. It says this, Hebrews 13, 9. It says, Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. And when Hebrew people talked about the heart, they weren't talking about their emotional life. They meant their mind, their will, their mind, their thoughts, and it included the emotions, but the sum to totality of their mind. 
So don't be carried away by all these various teachings and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart, for the mind, to be strengthened by grace or established by grace. The sense of this verb is to be uh, to or become settled securely and unconditionally in something. And what is that something? That's why I have the picture of the resurrection and the cross up there. What are we to be? What is God settling us into securely and unconditionally? Just as we were taught, the gospel, the gospel of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, that declares to us the promise of life. Oh, hey, I'm getting some uh, water here. Sorry about that. How did that happen? There we go. I guess I needed a drink, so. Um, In the context, now we go to the context. We go back to um, Colossians chapter 1. There we go. And I'm going to read through this real quick. We give thanks to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praying always for you since we heard of your faith. There's the faith part, right? In Christ Jesus, I told you it was alluded to. And the love which you have for all the saints because, and here we go, of the hope laid up for you in heaven. What is the hope laid up for us in heaven? Eternal life, right? Our hope. That's our hope that we will live forever with Jesus. We'll be in the presence of God for all eternity. And the love which you have for all the saints, I already read that, of which you previously heard in the word of truth. So you have the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now parallel to that is the word of truth. Parallel parallel to that is the gospel which has come to you. Just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Even it has been doing in you since, also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. So you have the hope laid up for you in heaven, the word of truth, the gospel, and the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. And we just read, having been established in the faith, just as you were taught. And who taught it to them? Epaphras. And what did he teach them? The gospel of grace. So this is something God does in your life, is he settles you securely and unconditionally into the gospel of grace so that the winds of doctrine and the winds of, of all these strange teachings can't, you know, can't shift us, that it doesn't move us. He's been doing that in my life for 40 years now. I grew up in a very legalistic boarding school, and Christianity to me was a bunch of rules that I did and a bunch of things I didn't do. You know, a bunch of things you have to do and a bunch of things you don't do. And I never really met the kindness of the Savior until that head injury, until after that head injury. So back to Colossians, we have one more. And this doesn't take any other text. Just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. And so the picture I have for this is a pitcher being poured into a glass and it's overflowing. And what are we grateful for? that he has rooted us in Jesus and in this depth of Christ's love. And that now he is continuing the work of building us into the body of Christ, into this holy temple made up of living stones. Nancy and I were living stones that became a part of the body of Christ in Bremerton. We were there for 27 years. And now we get to come here and be a part of your body, being built into your body as part of that body of Christ, that holy temple. And then the third thing, that he is settling you securely and unconditionally into the gospel of grace, into this gospel. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. For by grace you have been saved through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. And so our job is to trust him. You know, I've said many times that our every moment of every day, every moment is an opportunity to either trust him or to trust something else. So I'll conclude with this. 
Just a little over four months ago, I, I arrived in your church, again a broken man. Broken by a final stage, stage four, metastatic prostate cancer diagnosis, which then led me into uh, coronary artery disease, progressive coronary artery disease, caused by the medications I was on for the cancer. And for the last five years, I've had setback after setback after sat setback. And Nancy's my champion. She has been with me through every setback. I'm tired, folks. That's why I'm sitting down. If I stood up, I'd probably have chest pain and we'd be going to the ER. So when I got diagnosed with metastatic cancer, Nancy and I decided, let's go to the big guns. Let's go to... Uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So as we were driving up to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, as we approached the building, I noted that it was on the corner of Valley and Yale. Fred Hutch is built right on top of where Vandy Camps is. To the east, up the hill, is Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And across the street from Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, toward the Mercer Street exit, is the curb. And I hadn't been back in 35 years. We didn't have time to stop then, but the next time we showed up, I sat down on that curb and I sobbed. And I didn't sob because I have metastatic cancer. I sobbed because God had given me 35 years of life that I didn't expect to live. So I know this. Grace isn't just a word for me. It's the power of Christ to change a broken life. And so I'm a witness of the radical grace, this radical, powerful grace that is working all in your life too, to root you deep in Jesus and into his love, to build you strong into this temple of living stones and to settle you securely and unconditionally in the gospel of truth and the gospel of grace. And our response, overflowing with thanksgiving. I'm grateful for all of you today. When I arrived here, I've been received with so much grace. So, in these days of my struggle, thank you for being here for me. I've come full circle. I've come home. Amen.